Judith Ivey is with us. She's appearing now on Broadway in Park Your Car in Harvard Yard with Jason Robards, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a bit. She's also received Tonys for Hurley Burley and Steaming, but I guess the larger audience, especially people outside New York, know you best from your film work. And your first movie with Paul Newman came about because his wife, Joanne Woodward, had seen you on Broadway and Steaming, right? Mm -hmm. How did that yeah. play out? Well, actually, I did a play with Joanne uh, prior to steaming and she kind of adopted me so she came to opening night and I think Paul was supposed to be there opening night and he didn't make it but he came to the party and uh, everyone was teasing me that I was the topic of marital strife between the two because they overheard her berating him uh -huh. and saying you just missed a great performance so he came back and saw it and he'd actually talked to me about playing his daughter in the movie and then steaming looked like it was going to run for a while and then when he saw steaming he said you don't want to play the daughter you want to play uh, this other character who gets to seduce paul uh, and i said yes that's exactly who i'd like to play so seduce him and his son <laughs> and his son so uh good day's work a good day's work yeah very nervous making work so uh then steaming didn't close and looked like it was going to run longer so i lost the role and then steaming did close. It was kind of a schizophrenic existence. And Paul heard and uh, unfortunately wasn't happy with the choice of actress at the time. And he came and said, we'd like to um, you know, hire you. So I leapt on a plane and flew f through a snow blizzard to Florida, to Fort Lauderdale, and landed in time to seduce Paul Newman. You know, it's a tough life. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, right? And that, that was Harry and Son. Harry and Son. And then shortly after that, I guess, was The Lonely Guy, right? Was that next yes. in line? That was next because Steve Martin had seen Steaming. So Steaming was a momentous uh, show in my life. It kind of turned me around as far as being in, having a film career. So we might as well talk about it now. I was going to wait, but since you mentioned it, in Steaming, you were nude on stage for 20 minutes or something right. of, the, of, the, of the show. Yeah. I, I would come on fully clothed. And as I chatted about my boyfriends or being beat up by my boyfriend or being kicked out by my boyfriend, that's the kind of character she was, then I would take my clothes off and enjoy the steam bath because it took place in the baths of London. And different women uh, came to the baths for different reasons. And there were some who wore raincoats because they were so modest and some yeah. who hid behind towels. But my character was one who was right out there. So. Now, I don't mean this to have a, a leering tone, but yeah. just in the interest of accuracy, did the effect of the steam obscure people's view, or was it pretty clear-cut? No, it was pretty clear-cut. The steam bath actually was off stage, so you opened a door and the steam came rolling out, and then you entered uh -huh. and went off. But it was like a locker room, so women came and took their clothes off and hung them up in the lockers and lounged around and sat in their towels or didn't sit in their towels or whatever they chose to do, so... Were you able to uh, gauge audience reaction? Uh, yeah, yeah. You, uh, it's so interesting. People are, are, I was just talking about it earlier, so uh, thrown by nudity. It's, it's a fascination. I guess the fact that you're so vulnerable, it's, uh, it fascinates them that you can stand there and do that in front of a lot of people and be that vulnerable. And there are a lot of comic elements. Uh, my favorite was the matinees because the, the uh, older women, we'll say, the elderly women were kind of thrown. They still paid their money and they still sat in their seats, but you would, you know, throw your line out to the audience and there would be all these programs steaming, 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 because they were all <laughs> watching you from behind their programs. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally the, the program would come down and they would enjoy themselves and get used to it. So you think the primary reaction once the surprise went away was that they sort of felt sympathetic to someone who was in such a vulnerable position as opposed to considering it erotic or whatever. Maybe, maybe That's what it was a both. lot of people said. Maybe it was both. Yeah, I think, well, I think you hear that, that there's going to be nudity and you're a bit uh, uh, titillated or you wonder, how am I going to handle it as an audience member? Uh, you know, my, my father was a bit nervous and wondered how he was going to handle it. But he said, you know, I completely forgot that it was you. And, of course, it was not a show about titillation. It was a show about these women finding themselves and 
solving the problem of the baths being closed. So you got caught up in the story and forgot. And the nudity was the normal part of the story because indeed you're in a bath. So people were adjusted to it. It took a while. I mean, it took them four, five or ten minutes where they had to yeah. get over it. And the field glasses came down, you know, and the programs came down. So, so now back to the movie. Steve Martin had also seen this and you get cast in The Lonely Guy. Charles Grodin was also in that movie, right? In The Lonely Guy, yes, yes. How funny was it just to hang around with these two guys? Oh, it was, you got paid to show up and laugh and they would tease me, she'll laugh at anything, why are we testing our material on her? She, they, would, they wrote a lot of The Lonely Guy scenes and improvised them and they would arrive in my Winnebago and say, all right, listen to this one and then they would, yeah you know, go through the scene. And if, if I didn't laugh, they knew it was really bad because I'm, I guess I do laugh at <laughs> anything. And uh, so they would toss it out and they'd say, okay, let's move on to the next one, you know, and here's, act that one out. But they were, they egged each other on. So it was great fun to be around both of them. All things being roughly equal, let's assume that on their own terms, you had a role for the stage offered mm -hmm. and a role for the screen and they were equally well written, equally appealing. Huh. Is the stage still a place you'd rather be? Is that what does it for you? Oh yeah, it's it, the stage is where you go to enjoy yourself and to exercise all your muscles. Uh, or that's where I go. I shouldn't be so pompous to say that you know the entire uh, um, uh, group of actors that that's the way it works. Some actors I know who's, who began on stage don't ever want to see it again. Once they've started doing film, they enjoy that more. But I just feel like I get a full workout when I'm on the stage. And that when I'm doing film and television, it, it requires only certain parts of mm -hmm. what I can do. And I'm uh, uh, egotistical enough that when I'm on stage, I'm the editor and I'm the focus puller and I'm the director and I'm everybody. Last night, you can park your car in Harvard Yard mm -hmm. and you're going to leave here mm -hmm. and gear it up to do it again. Right. And this is, although it's a comedic performance, it's also an emotional performance. Mm -hmm. And every time I go to the theater, whether it's a musical or a drama or whatever, at some point I find myself wondering, how do these performers get to this level night after night, mm. time after time, especially now this one hasn't been around that long, but mm -hmm. especially when one is, you know, runs for two, three years and sometimes right. a performer becomes associated with, with a part, where does that come from? And right now you're sitting here, but in two hours from now, you're going to be in a state. Mm -hmm. You're going to be overwrought. Oh, you just think of all kinds of things. You know, I think of, uh, well, when uh, uh, he actually does die, I think of, I, I am so crazy about Jason Robards, all I have to do is sit there and imagine that Jason has died and it breaks me up because I'm so in love with him. Uh, if it's, you're particularly, your concentration isn't there that day, you know, your daughter has, you know, carried her dirty diaper across the floor right before you left to go to the theater or something and you're in a crabby mood and not concentrating, then you got to maybe think of something else that upsets you and revs you up. But it's, it's really working. In, in this particular case, it, it, Jason Robards is so immediate to the story and so there for you that in many ways we just let each other run with it now. It's not, it doesn't require uh, concentration or, oh my gosh, I better think about Biafra or, you know, something mm -hmm. that will take me down this path. I've got to, uh, I just sit and look at him and play with him because we so enjoy one another. And it, it's constantly within the moment. It's spontaneous. So it's always, uh, you never know what, what's going to happen next. This is a uh, two-person play, no intermission. Mm -hmm. goes about an hour and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Jason Robards plays this uh, retired professor. He taught uh, English and uh, music history, music appreciation. Right. And uh, he's getting on in years. And the story unfolds that you come to uh, keep house for him mm -hmm. after the death of your husband. But it turns out, although he thinks you're a stranger, 
there are these connections between your family and him that run through the years and, and add to some resentment that you feel toward right. him, and then the thing plays itself out. This has got to be kind of exhausting for both of you because you're both obviously in every scene. It's just the two mm -hmm. of you. It gives you a, a run for your money. There, there are some nights where I've just thought, oh, what time is it? You know, how am I going to get through the rest of it? But once again, it's, uh, you look across at uh, someone of his magnitude and it clicks in. <laughs> when I saw it, the audience seemed very appreciative and you overhear mm -hmm. as you do when you leave the theater, strangers around you making their yeah. appreciative comments. And the reviews were good, except for Frank Rich in the New York Times, yeah. who really walloped it. He didn't so much wallop you and mm -hmm. Robards, but the play itself he mm -hmm. found predictable and kind of a hackneyed premise and everything. Mm -hmm. when, when you see that, what does it do to you? Well, I don't read reviews till like a month later. And uh, so, because I think it, good or bad, um, they affect you. I mean, when I've gotten rave reviews, I stink the next night because then I'm sort of full of myself and yeah. I'm trying to act out all those wonderful moments they pointed out and I just don't uh, do as well. So I quit doing it actually more for the good reviews than the bad reviews. The bad reviews hurt, but that's, I don't consider the reviews really for me. I've yet to change a performance because of what somebody said. Uh, that would be unfair to the, to the playwright and the director and my fellow actors if all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, oh, and came on the next night yeah. with a whole other, you know, take on it. If they'd probably want to fire me on the spot. Um, certainly I would get my hands slapped. So uh, the reviews are really for people who pay $42.50, $47.50, or what is it, $100 or now to go see Miss Saigon. Um, it doesn't really matter to me. I don't like being talked about in a negative way in print, but um, I'm really proud of my work in this piece, and uh, I'm usually pretty proud of it, so it doesn't really matter what somebody says to me. I'm my worst critic, so they can't say mm -hmm. anything nearly as bad as what I would come up with. So. But that's not, uh, th that's a pretty impressive bit of discipline and self-confidence to be able to say, and it makes sense as a strategy, I'm not going to read this for a month. Right. But it is the New York Times, after all. And everybody yeah. knows that if not the success or failure, then, then certainly to some extent the success or failure is affected by what Frank Rich says in the New York Times, mm -hmm. and other people are going to be talking about it. And to be able to hold off reading it for a month... Well, but you're talking about a commercial success, about how many people will come and right. see it. Uh, I can't affect that, whether except by doing a good job. And so that when so, you see it and you say, gosh, I had such a good time, and you go tell that person, and they go tell, that's all I can contribute to the success of a piece. If a critic says, I think this stinks, and that critic has a certain amount of power, it still doesn't affect me. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I mean, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm certainly not going to change my performance based upon um, what one critic says. I think it's very sad that the theater is being uh, given life or death based upon one critic. And since um, he gets to say bad things about me in public, then uh, in this public forum I will say I don't think he's a very good critic. So, and that's Why not... not uh, well, he's not, uh, a critic's job is to report, and uh, uh, an example would be uh, the night that Frank Rich came to the theater, we received a, a standing ovation. Now, that wasn't anywhere in the review, and I think it's his job to report what the evening happened that evening. If it's totally about his opinion, then um, that is... A, a different kind of, uh, that is a, a critique that goes into a, a, a book of study. Back now with Judith Ivey. In addition to steaming, you also got a Tony for your performance as Bonnie the Stripper in uh, the David Rabe play, Hurley Burley. Mm -hmm. What a cast. <laughs> I mean, this was amazing. William Hurt was in this, and Christopher Walken was in it. Harvey Keitel was in it. 
Jerry well, Stiller. Who am I forgetting? Jerry, Jerry Stiller, Stiller minus Ann Mira. He minus Ann Mira, <laughs> yes. They split up for that. Sigourney Weaver and Cynthia Nixon. So it was uh, a powerhouse of uh, talent there. It was which, really exciting. What's your strongest recollection from that? Oh, gosh, there's so many. Um, I guess the strongest is the, the, the guys were really guys, you know, and the play encouraged that. And none of the three actresses ever got to work together. We were all in individual scenes with the guys. And uh, so we got a little fed up with the guy behavior and uh, got tired of being talked to the, the way that the characters talk to the women mm -hmm. in the play. Very gruff. Very gruff, very chauvinistic, very uh, sexist, put down, you know, uh, kind of joy toy behavior. And uh, so we did a, a, a version, which really Sigourney wrote most of it, called Hurley Gurley, which we performed uh, after the show one night in Chicago when we were trying it out in Chicago. And we teased the guys that we could do our version in eight minutes where it took them three hours and 15 <laughs> minutes to do Hurley Burley. So uh, that was probably one of the greatest moments was bonding as the three actresses, the women in the play versus the guys. And it, w it went on and on and on because the guys were... Uh, they get into all of their roughhousing and their teasing on stage within a performance and get carried away. And the play was three hours and 15 minutes. And so we were always encouraged to yeah. pick up the cues and move it along. And uh, so my character came on in the second act only. And she, uh, uh, one night I didn't get on until 10 o'clock. And it was because these guys were horsing around and pausing and, and roughhousing and so on. So, I started timing it, and I had a particular, um, I had a whole monologue, and then uh, Harvey Keitel's character would uh, say something to me, and I would turn around and say, what's your name again? And he would say, Phil, because that was the name of his character. And Harvey was getting into his pausing, so he, uh, um, I started counting under my breath, 1,001, 1,002, 1,000. And about the fifth night of this, he got, I got 1,010. And he had not answered me, Phil. So I ad lib, should I start with an easier question? And the house went up for laughs, and Harvey was not pleased. <laughs> but then, why did you do that to me, Judy? You know, so. <laughs> Judith Ivey is appearing along with Jason Robards at the Music Box Theater on Broadway and Park Your Car in Harvard Yard. Thanks a lot for coming by. We enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Time for us to say so long for now. See you later.